love, ladies and gentlemen, this is Fate.org, the People's Honorable Alliance for Exposing the Truth. Fate.org, bringing you the truth as usual, and I am your host, The Wordsmith. We have another very special episode for you today. The caliber of this guest in the realms of academia and science is off the charts. My brother Dan Winter joining us today. Dan Winter, physicist, and so much more. What a special conversation. Be ready to touch upon topics ranging from frequency and vibration, love, to black holes, 5G and radio technology. The powers of shamans, spirit science. Oh, yes. We're covering so much today because I just had to take advantage of the opportunity and just let the conversation go where it went. And let me tell you something what a special conversation it was. And the most important topic of the day, which is really what brought us here to this conversation is the fact that, and I really want you to pay attention to this, people, because your health, your well-being, your spirit, everything is dependent upon this. Do not forget that you are a water-based being. And so, the overarching story here is that municipalities are destroying the quality of our water which of course is an increased health risk to the public, which is you and I, by leasing space on our water towers for Wi-Fi and cell phone antennas. We're talking about radiation generators. And they are placing these all around our water towers. If, if you don't think there's anything wrong with that, if you, you know, anyway, this is a problem and it needs to be addressed. And that was my main purpose in speaking with Dan today to kind of shed a little light on, on the subject. You know, I'd like to really take this opportunity to point out that to those who are really in tune to the pulse of the universe you have this thing it's more than an intuition it's something even deeper than that but it's just an an understanding of certain things and you know I've spent many years talking about certain topics with people and, and trying to explain things as best I can and if you just don't get it, you have no connection in that way. I mean, you, you cannot fathom these things until you, until you do. But you just know certain things because you can actually literally feel them on multiple planes and in multiple dimension. And a lot of, a lot of these things I said, and this is going back decades, I mean, I, you know, and I've said that, listen, the things that I'm telling you now, I would say to people, the things that I'm telling you, the things that I know, the things that I'm feeling, the things that I'm seeing, the things I've experienced are so very real. It's just going to take time for science to catch up and prove what I'm saying. And we are now at a point where the work of people who have been seeking to be able to explain and understand these certain phenomena and aspects of our world on a scientific level 
well, the, the fruits of those labors are, are now, they're happening now. Although, what we're dealing with in reality are truly ancient sciences, uh, the most fundamental of our spiritual existence, really. So this is going back through time. So in actuality, we're actually reclaiming these understandings and just bringing them back to the forefront of knowledge in these times, which is very exciting. So thank you very much to people like Dan Winter and, and other such minds and spirits that are doing this work. Truly mind-blowing, truly mind-blowing, Dan Winter. Okay, let's, let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here today. You're going to hear some incredible things. I actually discuss some things that I do discuss in my intimate circles, but I've never put on a platform like this, so you will get some nuggets from me as well. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So sit back, strap yourselves in, be ready, get ready, open your mind, partake if you got it, and see you on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fate.org podcast. In case you've forgotten, it was fate and nothing less. That is the title of the podcast. It was fate, fate.org, fate standing for the People's Honorable Alliance for Exposing the Truth. And today I have a very, very special guest coming on the show today. He is a brilliant scientist. Um, I would venture to say one of the leading, if not the leading scientist of our time. Um, his name is Dan Winter. Dan Winter's background is as, mul is as multifaceted as his viewpoint. Uh, graduating with honors from the University of Detroit, Dan pursued graduate studies in psychophysiology and the origin of languages. In addition to his academic background, he has worked as a systems analyst with IBM, an industrial metallurgist, and as a crystallographer. He has undertaken many diverse studies from quantum physics to modeling at the MIT Space Lab to developing the early biofeedback prototype equipment as Dr. Albert Axe's protege. Widely traveled, Dan has sojourned to study at the Gurdjieff School of Sacred Gymnastics in Florence with Buckminster Fuller, the Giza Pyramids, Israel, the Andes, and Finhorn. Dan draws on many sources, including science, mythology, popular culture, and even channeled information, looking for ideas about the deep connectedness of all things and how the profound nature of our oneness can be approached from architecture or art, math or biology, electronics, computers, or myth. Currently, Dan is a consultant on multimedia and virtual reality computer animation projects and travels and lectures the, around the world. Looks like someone's here. Dan, how are you doing? I'm good. Can you hear me okay? I hear you crystal clear, perfectly. Great. How about you? You hear me well? Yes, yes. It seems like we have a good connection. All is good. <laughs> Wonderful. It's it's truly great to be here with you. Um, you know, we it's been a while since we've spoken, but uh, I'm definitely honored to to be present here with you today. And I thank you very much for your time. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Um, so then uh, we're going to focus on uh, hazards of electromagnetic communications, right, basically? Yes, um, that's exactly what I'd like to focus on today. As um, I've been noticing over the last few years that our water towers around Long Island and probably in other places, I'm sure, as well, uh, the municipalities are... Um, essentially leasing space on their water towers for 
Wi-Fi antennas along with cell phone antenna. And it's, it's really incredible to me that this is happening right in front of people's faces and no one's paying attention, no one's noticing. Uh, there's no connection going on in the mind that that might be a problem. And I know that it is. And I knew that you'd be the person who could help kind of unravel uh, this situation and explain it uh, so that people can wrap their minds around the science of what's actually happening um, to the water as a result of these antennas. And then, of course, what happens to our biophysiology uh, in response to what has been done to the water. So then um, I have a few graphics prepared. Uh, so maybe I'll do a share screen at some point. Okay, that's perfect. All right. So then, um, you know, the background here, uh, when we were traveling in Italy, I had a similar experience to you where I realized that there were many towns where they put the, the, the Wi-Fi and the microwave cell towers. They would mount them in the church steeples and in the school steeples without even telling the people. <laughs> and, really? Yeah, and, and we really noticed uh, the, um, the heavy uh, emotional atmosphere in those villages, uh, which is really very painful. And uh, so I tried to dissect that. Um, we we uh, published a, a paper on that called Microwave Life and Death. And uh, maybe I'll share that graphic just one, one second here. See if that's going to work. Maybe it's not going to work. Yeah, I'm seeing your screen. Okay. Good. Let me close this. So um, basically... Uh, it showed the example in, I believe it was UK, where a bunch of uh, villagers got together and they actually documented, this is the building here, uh, that the uh, uh, cell phone towers mounted on top of the building uh, corresponded to a, a dramatic increase in cancer rate in that building. And they took it to a judge, uh, it was a five-story building, and in fact they were able to get, it was in Bristol, UK, and they were able to get the cancer, cancerous uh, RF towers removed. Uh, so wow. there is actually legal precedent to being able to do that, and that's, that's an important point. Um, but So then we, we want to look at the biology of that. How, how and why did that very high frequency disturb biology directly? An early work that was done it was by a partner of ours, um, Stefan Cardino here, and I show the graphic. Uh, he's probably the leading geobiology school of Europe, Stefan Cardino, geniedulieu.ch. Um, and he uh, was measuring, the, basically they would measure the size of the aura field. They had two or three different ways of measuring that. And they measured it, uh, what happened to the human aura when you lift up your, your, your phone, your, your cell phone, and you hold it to your head and dial. And as you can see from the graphic, the the aura would collapse over 50% uh, when uh, you began to use the cell phone. Wow. And, uh, and that was using the GDV, the Sonotest, and the IGA. And you can see that discussion about uh, Stefan Cardino at the article and also at goldenmean.info slash geobiology. So what, what is my personal background here in, in looking at, high frequencies in the body? That's the, the question. And uh, my background here uh, started with uh, Bob Dratch, Microwave Scanning Missions Technologies, where he was scanning the body uh, and uh, using uh, high microwave emissions from the body to, to uh, scan. In this case, it was he did a history of uh, emotional trauma by scanning the spine for the high frequency microwave of what is the harmonics of adenosine diphosphate, ADP, ATP. And I have that graph here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the probably one of the more important molecules of the body is that ADP, ATP, that adenosine diphosphate, triphosphate oh, bond right. mm -hmm. geometry, because um, biology uses that specific quantum distance, ADP to ATP, as a kind of uh, teeter-totter, up and down 
to store and retrieve energy anytime it has an extra dollar bill, so to speak. So it's the energy currency of the cell is stored in the ADP ATP bond. And so since my friend Bob famously used that uh, bond geometry for the microwave scanning that was so effective, um, he, our friend Wendy Thacker, he was able to actually read the emotional history of trauma of her life basically from that microwave from her spine. Wow. And it, he later showed that it was, a, it was a microwave scanning horn amplifier antenna. And if you know anything about uh, microwave guide antennas, the way you learn about them is to study, study the physics of essentially ceremonial magic. It's waveguide theory. And uh, so, but anyway, so that, that scanning horn device turned out to be, and he showed us the ultimate dousing tool that the earth grid was measurably symbiotic to uh, the specific radiant frequencies of cellular microwave. And so uh, we realized that, that the, w the way the body radiates high frequencies, and ADP is just one example, uh, is uh, symbiotically tuned to the earth like a communications bloodstream. Now, two things, points to be made. One later when I wrote my book, Origin of Biologic Meg Entropy, um, which said if you take the Planck length and time, which is the musical key signature of every wave that physics has ever measured, um, that if you multiply exact integer exponents of golden ratio times Planck, you get things like the radii of hydrogen and the exact frequencies of photosynthesis, the only the two that make it go, and the HR, uh, heart rate variability, LF, and all the critical frequencies. And as you see on the right here, you get the harmonics of the, the Mayer wave the, and the sacrocranial uh, frequencies that are so famously the spine liquid pump mechanism of Kundalini and bliss and sacrocranial therapy. And you get this exact 1.91 angstrom wavelength of ADP. So in other words, the body uses high frequencies as a part of the mechanism of what I call DNA radio. Now later we learned that it is that key frequency series uh, uh, integer powers of golden ratio times Planck, which produces implosive collapse and translates the transverse wave to longitudinal wave at the Planck threshold. Longitudinal waves are compressional. They go faster than light and go through about anything and do action at a distance. And they're clearly the mechanism of our stories of spiritual science and collective unconscious and all that fun stuff is a longitudinal wave, sometimes called scalar. So, the critical biological high frequencies fit that scale measurably as the ADP is phase conjugate to Planck, meaning that the whole business of efficient communication, which is obviously what the collective unconscious is about, includes those high frequencies. So um, we know that uh, the body's ability to get that implosive longitudinal coherence requires of what is effectively bliss. Now, we also know that bliss or peak states of consciousness arises when those sacrocranial frequencies, which you can see right on the table here, are actually uh, active. When, they, when the harmonic cascade lines up and is implosive, your, if your spine liquid is, is pumping, not only is it clinically impossible to be depressed, but it's the end of addiction and the beginning of kundalini and bliss. So all of that is imploding and you feel that burning right down to the level of Planck, and you're engaging what I think is the real DNA radio, which is longitudinal waves. So, it, uh, all of that to say is that um, we know that biology needs and should have reserved its high frequencies, its microwave. And unfortunately, the Federal Communications Communi Commission has not reserved the microwave frequencies, which we can prove are the mechanism of DNA radio and the physics is right here, adenosine diphosphate. Uh, and by the way, that 1.9 angst, one angstroms itself is, is very high terror. It's very high frequency, but it, that whole cascade, harmonics of Planck times golden ratio, should have been reserved by the FCC for DNA more important than cell phone right, radio. Right, for humans. So essentially, this, this, this process uh, of, of DNA radio um, and its interaction and, and how, it, how it implodes and, and um, the, uh, the integrity of that process is highly, 
highly dependent on having a clear, open communications with the earth, which is what we're saying that all, all these antennas and, and, free, and unnatural frequencies that they've put in, in these particular ranges um, are, are degrading or have degraded significantly that process. Uh, degrading is probably even an extremely uh, generous word. It, it's probably more like destroyed. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we shouldn't say, well, then all, you know, RF communications are destructive of biology, uh, but it is true that um, even practically speaking, uh, my partner and I, uh, now when anybody turns on Wi-Fi within, you know, a household distance of us, we feel it immediately. And our house has to be Wi-Fi free. And we can feel it immediately when you push the button to turn on the Wi-Fi. We're all going, ah! you know, it's just that we can absolutely feel it for sure. Right. So, you know, we know for sure. And what has happened is that if you spend a good part of your life tuning your body to have a precise aura and have access to bliss, you get more and more sensitive to these things. As well, you should. Right. So. Right. Yeah, electromagnetic sensitivities is not a defect. It's, it's, it's evolution in process. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, our civilization hasn't recognized what evolution is, where actually now we can document quite well, if we understand the physics of death, that at death you have a coherent plasma bubble, that you can measure what happens at death and where you go with it and why it needs to implode. Otherwise, you don't communicate with the voices of ancestors, which is say you don't embed in the longitudinal grid of the locality. And which is proven by the fact that our therified plasma system is, is documented so effective in releasing ghosts, for example, because uh, ghosts need what Castaneda, Castaneda called sacred space, which we now know is a charge implosive environment enough, sufficient enough to gain the uh, inertial uh, escape velocity for charge distribution which is the longitudinal array, which is ancestral memory, which is why you can't make a druid phone call if you're not on an earth magnetic line cross point, which is the same thing that Cozy Rev Mirror people proved. And Bruce Cathy simultaneously proved those exact same points had a dramatic decrease in nuclear critical mass. And we now know why, because the compressional longitudinal at those nodal array, that 5D grid as it were, uh, is, is precisely engaging that completed conjugate cascade to embed longitudinal and engage not just DNA radio, but the only really communication efficient system of the universe, which is longitudinal coherence. Meaning, if you don't get longitudinal coherence in your aura, which is simply, can you lucid dream or take memory through death? What the Egyptians called the, the ba from the ka in our language of putting it. So that whole process of getting that kind of coherence in the aura requires an electromagnetically not just pristine environment, but one where the Schumann harmonics are still alive. So, so in that sense, we're talking about locations on the earth like Sedona, Arizona, um, Asheville, North Carolina, um, and the many that exist around the world. These are the kind of points that we're talking about in the earth's grid that are still um, un undisturbed, shall we say. Yeah, and it's important to say that there are earth magnetic line cross points just about everywhere where nature still has any life in it. Uh, and the important thing to say is this is not subjective. The Cozy Rev Mirror people knew before they could plant the microwave coherent metal cylinder, which was you know, military quality telepathy thousands of miles apart every time, that you measured whether the magnetic line had enough uh, magnetic flux density in nanoteslas. And, and you know if you've got, in fact, a DNA radio going to work there. You know, this is not right. subjective. And another way of measuring it, interestingly, is flameinmind.com. We can measure whether the tree there has Schumann harmonics, which now we know are phase conjugate to Planck and therefore implosive and longitudinal embedded. So you can know in advance which tree is going to live or die, and you can know in advance which building is make, going to make a seed grow by measuring the low-frequency, weak electromagnetic field, which is, if it's implosive, it's going to be centripetal and alive. So, so... And, and this is all, and, and, and I, I enjoy the fullness of the conversation. So is, um, have, has there been a determination as to a, a radius or, or a, a, a minimum distance from civilization, uh, you know, where you would start to find uh, the, the resonance in trees that would 
that are that are hospitable for it to have a long, very long, healthy life, as opposed to being degraded by the systems in that environment. Yeah, obviously there would be many factors. I mean, I can tell one story. When we were in this, when we first discovered that you could predict which tree was going to live or die by seeing whether the low frequency cascade was Schumann inclusive. And I learned this technique from famous professor Phil Callahan, Phil Callahan tuning into nature. Actually, he was using what he called the Callahan antenna, which was just simply a living hemp fibers dipped in sea salt or sweat, a high dielectric biologic capacitor. And then you amplify a microvolt, microvolt and spectrum analyzed the same way you do a brainwave. And with that tool, we were in a forest in, in Netherlands, actually, and a very lovely, healthy, happy, healthy, a lot of old sacred trees, it was wonderful, but there was one that was dying. We put it, and there was a nasty, I think it was around 90 hertz, a nasty frequency there that shouldn't be there, a big spike. It looked, you know, obviously we knew what was killing that tree. There was a harmonic, didn't belong there. It was a big spike, didn't fit the cascade. And we looked around, and sure enough, only about, I don't know, 20, 15 meters away, there was a very large metal fence in that forest, just happened to be pointing at that tree. And we hung our spectrum analyzer over that metal fence, and guess what, 90 hertz. 90 hertz. So we, we know exactly which capacitor was murdering that tree, and wow. how it was happening, why. So, you know, but there's no critical threshold for these things. What I can say is, uh, in terms of, well, how far away from civilization you have to be. You, you, know, you know how those people, they, they go around and they photograph orbs with their high shutter speed camera, the orb, their little plasma balls. For right. example, if you cut down a bunch of trees and you stick them in the, in the basement of a good wooden barn, you'll have a huge number of those orbs, those little plasma balls. But if you go into a metal building in an ugly city, you will never, ever, 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 ever photograph an orb just about. Right. <laughs> because, because, because the plasma is not in a charge permissive environment. So basically living plasma, like our Therify.net, so famous for you know, rejuvenation, we're in 20 countries, we're having some success. And that living plasma is a cold plasma cloud, which our therapists know is... You treat it like you do your pet kitten. It's not going to run its motor and heal you with its aura unless it likes you. And the plasma from our little Therify plasma tubes is just like your pet kitten. If anybody comes in the room that's a little bit negative, you need to ask them gently to leave quickly because the plasma cloud is going to go away. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, now the way the way that they teach that in a physics class, and I talk, I'm speaking medical physics now. Is, is instructive, so that, and I told the story many times, that you know, negative ion wind is proven that the, the, the side of the hospital with negative ion wind from the ocean is medically documented to be, have a dramatically higher healing rate. So there's no, there's no, it's absolutely medically clear that a negative ion wind is healing. And in fact, strong negative ion wind can drive infections like spinal meningitis right out of the spine. Our, our friend uh, did that cell care therapy. Anyway. So strong negative ion winds are profoundly, but negative ions are fragile, just like the coal plasma, which is cold atmospheric plasma, now famous medically. And our, we think the best coal plasma is negatropic due to phase conjugation, like therify.net. Anyway, the same thing that will kill negative ions will kill the living plasma from something like therify, or, and it will kill the orb, or your favorite nature spirit, or your grandma's ghost. And that is large metal surfaces with large electrostatic pollution. That'll kill a negative ion or your grandma's ghost or plasma <laughs> because charge distribution efficiency is required for the collective unconscious DNA radio. The word for that in electrical engineering is dielectric constant, efficiency of capacitance. So you can, you can see why your building needs to be made of biologic material and not steel and aluminum if you want your grandmother's ghost to whisper in your ear. <laughs> Hemp, hemp all day. Build my structures out of hemp. I don't want anything else. <laughs> it's a fabulous dielectric hemp. Well said, yes. Um, so, well, that's interesting. So, yeah, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm curious just to get your thoughts on, I had mentioned to you also about this new project I have going on with the, um, with the Tesla ring and the, the certificate of authenticity card that I'll be giving people with that, which is giving off negative ions. Um, I, so from the research I did, if you're in a forest, typically the, the output 
or the field that you'd be in would be giving off around 2,500 to 5,000 uh, units of negative ion per minute. Um, the cards that I have are giving off 10,000. So I think that that's a pretty significant uh, number. Um, do you think that, yeah. Well, I mean, negative ion wind generators and when coupled, for example, with ozone generation are very, can be very beneficial to uh, cleaning up the air in, in a building. And will also actually, uh, a negative ion wind that's strong enough will also literally burn uh, dirt out of the air <laughs> and because uh, they will ionize it. Uh, and if you've measured that, I'm not familiar with your product, but it, it, you know, the one thing you might be said is, you tell people it's great to make some negative ions and that's helpful, but also try to create an atmosphere in which they can survive, <laughs> you know, right, right. Which, which means, you know, big metal surfaces with, with electrosmog coming out of them uh, are going to kill those negative ions the same way. Whereas if, if you have an ancient temple, the negative ions will live forever. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. The environment that they come into is definitely important. Um, Okay, so so let's let's circle back now. So here we have these this water tower, and the water tower's got the Wi-Fi and cell phone antennas placed all around it, uh, essentially creating a, a vortex of radiation right where the water is. So what is that doing to the water? Let's 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 start there. No, that's a very appropriate question. And your intuition, I think, is profoundly correct that that's a very perverse and dangerous thing. But scientists will find it tricky to document that. But it, it, I just wanted to just to say to that point that, right, as a couple of people have tried to sue over this specific yes. situation, the municipalities respond and, oh, we, we had a third party company come in and, yeah. and they yeah. said everything is all good. You're, you're, yeah, don't right. worry about it. You're fine. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, oh God, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it, well, we start with the physics. I was the one who wrote the equation to prove that the hydrogen bond is profoundly phase conjugate to Planck. We have three hydrogen radii that are exactly equal in ratio X bonds to Planck. It's, it's not a coincidence. Hydrogen is therefore fractal and implosive, and that is the center of the water bond and the DNA bond, obviously. So clearly, the conjugate frequencies which make DNA radio works, and all start with hydrogen and water. So water is obviously the ideal, particularly if it's organized in living water, the ideal receptor to receive the DNA radio of the high frequency coherence. At, this, at the same time, when you have this, this dangerous microwave being radiated into the water, you can be sure that the ancestral memory and the sacred healing force of that living water is dying fast. But your challenge is you need to prove that to your municipality. Uh, and I, I mean, there are some suggestions here. Um, you could do some seed germination trials. You could do the GDV technique, uh, measure before and after that water, and our friends do that work. Uh, uh, Bio-well.com, uh, Karatkos GDV, gas discharge visualization, they're doing excellent measures of the capacitance radiance of water and correlating that again to seed germination. Another thing you can do, um, you could measure soil compaction rate at the base of the tower. This is another way to force legally uh, sue uh, to have removed a microwave tower because uh, it's been demonstrated that uh, soil compaction is a useful agricultural measure of microbial activity in the soil. And so soil compaction is a very good way to measure whether the soil is alive or dead. And this, is, this will stand up in court. And the fact is, obviously, those microwaves are going to kill those soil microbes. So that soil at the base of the microbe tile is going to die. And that is cheap to measure as soil compaction. And that's something you can walk into a courtroom with and say, hey, you just murdered my soil. Get it out of there. Exactly right. And if it's doing that to the soil, then, of course, what is it doing to us? So we exactly, exactly. We are not only, people are not only drinking this water, but even if if you know, people are, are, are hip enough to, uh, to have filtration systems and things like that. The majority of the time, they're, they're not thinking that extra step, which is the shower. So you're, they're still being covered in, in, in this water and, it's, and the, you know, the epidermis is the largest organ of the body. So everything is still coming in directly into the bloodstream. 
And we, we do find we have other technologies, theimploder.com, for example, theimploder.com. We have a vortex a shower and a super imploder magnetic. And this does add dramatic spin density to that water. And you can see the difference in seed germination. So there are ways to restore some of that spin density. But obviously, since you need to do some proving to your local munis municipality, uh, there are a whole variety of ways you can prove that that water has been damaged by that microwave. And uh, maybe there, I'm sure there would be allies in your struggle, a uh, Caracas GDV, uh, the soil compaction people, the Callahan people, um, the people that do um, Phil Callahan's publication, uh, what's it, it was called, um, America, oh, I'll think of it. But there are people that could be excellent allies for you in doing those proofs to your town. Great, yeah, uh, please, I'll definitely take a list of that after and, and I'll reach out to everyone. Um, and also, of course, just for anyone listening, I will provide links to a number of the things that, that Dan has discussed, uh, including some of his inventions and, um, and great works. I'll provide links for all that in the description below. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, how would you qualify or, or how would you explain um, the potential effects then of that radiated water, um, you know, having been radiated by those specific frequencies of, of, of Wi-Fi and, uh, uh, and cell phone, um, how would you explain what that could be doing or is doing to the biophysiology of, of a person? Well, you know how they say that uh, if you've got a car full of children and you suddenly drive past a living river, everyone in the car suddenly needs to pee. Uh, it, it's because the water in their bodies is always wanting to reach out to the a stream where they can connect with all. Yeah, that's so funny. I never would have thought of that. Right. And, yeah. and um, so they say that water was, uh, people were invented by water because it wanted to walk around. <laughs> intelligence in water is very important, obviously. Right. But in geobiology circles, uh, one way to understand water is, is where they teach you, uh, you make a map of the underground water flow under a house, and you very carefully avoid putting beds and even chairs over an underground stream. You know why? Because... <laughs> <laughs> When, when you're sleeping, your aura will want to go with it, actually. Uh, and, and that's been measured, that if you walk over a live living stream, your aura goes with the water. It doesn't stay in your body, actually. Uh, and all of that is because the, the immortality is actually the plasma that can project. It's not in your body. It's, it's, it's where your aura goes when it's not in your body that's actually reaching toward immortality. And all of those processes require that high-frequency coherence. And unfortunately, um, actually, one of the ways, you know, the, the fourth state of water, the Gerald Pollock people and those people, they're, what they're actually talking about is phase conjugation in water. And one way you can document that is the formation of what they call a clathrate state or the clathrate cages in water, which are basically dodeca ecosa, uh, just like Buckminster fullerene, which are phase conjugate structures. So the natural geometry actually of a water molecule like carbon, when carbon grows, it's not actually diamond lattice. Car carbon is most life-giving state, grows into a dodeca ecosa called oh, Buckminster fullerene, the hottest subject in all of chemistry. Well, it turns out water does the same thing. It'll want to grow into these clathrates, these dodeca ecosa, which is very alchemic and magical. And those things cannot form in water that has the wrong high frequencies. So the, the chemistry of water needs to be studied, and this is absolutely something that we should join our allies with and prove, you know, life force in water. But the cheap thing to demonstrate for these people, I, I think, would be you can take that water and do seed germination trials. You know how they did that Larry Dossie's famous book on prayer, when children pray to growing seeds and the dramatic effect? Uh, you know, should we send love was the, the paper. But it, so it, it's, it's been measured quite dramatically, the effect of children's love on growing seeds, you know. Well, yeah, I've seen a number of such studies. Yeah, those, those measures are not effective, not expensive to make. And in fact, uh, you know, again, could stand up in court. So if you 
if, if your community has any agriculture in it, you go to those farmers and you say, here, we're going to do some before and after measures of water that did or did not come from those microwave devices and show the effect on seed germination. Excellent. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great direction. Um, I'm definitely going to, uh, definitely going to pursue that. And so, so now we know already that, that cell phone towers and such um, have caused increased cancer rates and pockets of cancer. Um, would this radiated water be just another way to deliver, uh, you know, a, a, a cancer package, essentially? Uh, Without taking conspiracy view, uh, what we do know is that uh, 1 to 4G uh, phone technology was uh, 1 to 5 gigahertz and that uh, 5G technology is 20 to 90 gigahertz. And um, the frequencies chosen are not chosen for biological reasons, and that's the sadness. Uh, so let me give you an example of the stupidity of the way f communication frequencies are chosen. When Tesla chose 60 cycle, for America, because uh, a 60 cycle, three phase motor would be conveniently around 1725 RPM. Um, he did not know that biology cared, actually. But now America needs to know that they are screwed because Tesla didn't know what biology was, <laughs> actually. And here's, here's how we can just prove that America just got screwed, because the best technology on the planet, which is grow, growing carbon nano and clath rates, uh, the carbon nanotechnology, which will replace all propulsion and structure on the planet for sure, uh, carbon nano can grow beautifully in 50 hertz, hello Europe, and can never ever grow in 60 hertz. Sorry America, you're screwed. And actually, this is a good lesson. The physics is I wrote the equation that Planck times golden ratio is 49.98 something hertz. It's bingo, 50 hertz. So 50 hertz can actually help life. In fact, if you, if you, and the cancer studies, wow. it, there are hundreds of cancer studies on what frequencies heal cancer. And the most often mentioned frequency that heals cancer in all of cancer literature is 50 hertz, <laughs> not 60. Hello, America. <laughs> and, uh, and so this wow. is now the beginnings of a lesson. America, if you are going to choose your radio communications frequencies, you need to know what biology is before you make the same mistake again. <laughs> wow. And, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, so, for example, we can know in the, we, we know what frequency uh, optically, the two, only two frequencies, they're very narrow peaks that make photosynthesis happen, the orange-purple, very narrow peaks are exactly golden ratio to plumb. And so we can choose optical frequencies, we can choose radio frequencies. So once you know what causes biology, then you can pick your radio intelligently. Right, exactly. You'd have to know, you'd really have to understand on the most fundamental levels what, what frequencies are and are not going to be in, in, in proper uh, yeah. res resonance with, with the biophysiology. And, and the answer is so all so easy. You take Planck, you multiply by golden ratio, and you keep doing that, and then you're done. <laughs> it's not complicated. And then that's called the origin of biologic negentropy, and it's the cover of my book, and fractalfield.com. It's all there, you know? So if you want to pick the right frequencies, it, it ain't even complicated. <laughs> so so you're saying that in, in Europe, this the, the 50... Yeah, is already that, that's the standard, or how, how, how yeah, is that? That's right. Yeah, f fifty hertz is the standard for just about everybody else except the CIA. I mean, America. <laughs> <laughs> it does that sound insidious to you? Well, you you could you could study about the hazards of artificial intelligence trying to control our, but that's that's more advanced conspiracy theory. We're not going to go there today. But at least begin to recognize that there are some frequencies that are sacred and there are some that are not. It's a very narrow line what produces biologic negentropy, and that is actually consciousness itself. And, and to, to, to center this conversation around, around the water, um, I think it's really important for people to... Uh, really step up their game on an individual basis in, in understanding 
the nature of water, how it's supposed to be, and, and what our interactions are supposed to be with water, being that we are water, completely water-based entities, um, nothing could be more important. Uh, That's you know. so well said. Very well said. Exactly. And if you study the nature of water bonds, ultimately you come to the nature of hydrogen and fractality and implosion and negentropy. So studying water is a beautiful way to learn the nature of life. Absolutely. And the natural growth for water is a clathrate. It's dodecaecosa, which is a phase conjugate negentropic structure. And that kind of implosion will not happen in water with that nasty cell phone towers on the side of the water tower. You know, Victor Schauberger's water vortex began to spontaneously get colder just before it started making power from gravity. And that water vortex implosion is the design of our theimploder.com, which we call Schauberger's dream. And, you know, even the plasma in our therify begins to spontaneously get colder. And all of that means that that frequency cascade is perfectly tuned to Planck and golden ratio phase conjugation. So that's what neg entropy is, that spontaneous coldness. And that, and that, that, that dodeca, uh, formation um, and, and implosion formation is that not that's the same as DNA exactly that the same geometry which is called clathrate cage in water which also is uh, how uh, Pat Flanagan named microhydrogen microhydrin it's it's a phase conjugator it's implosive negentropic and if you take that pentodeca and you step it down a helix and blink ten times you've exactly modeled precisely the, the helix of DNA and the, the vertical axis of turn, the horizontal axis of X, Y, and Z axis are all integer exponents of golden ratio. So the DNA is a perfect golden ratio phase conjugate implosion device, absolutely. And it will braid recursively and thicken, and that way it actually will impose the long waves, and that's the physics of bliss, actually, and it's measurable. And, you know, and that, that was actually my introduction to you. Uh, you know, the first, the first lecture, the first video that I watched was, was on uh, the, the geometry of DNA, uh, which yes. was about two and a half, three hours or so video. And I watched it a couple of times and really just trying to soak it all in. And it really was mind blowing. And I'm going to put a link for that out there too in the description, because if you really sit with it and you, and you try, and I, I understand that there, there's a lot of, you know, seemingly high, high science and high scientific words and things being used. But if you, if you just take your time with it, I, you know, I, I'm speaking to the people listening, if you take your time with it and just try to understand the points one by one, you know, pause it, take notes, go back, listen again, and, and really sit through it. Once you, once you catch it, you got it. And you just, it just boom. I mean, you have this, you know, this epiphany. It's, it's really mind blowing to understand the perfection um, and the signature of the designer that yeah, made of this, the DNA yes. of the DNA when you know when you're talking about the the, the, the ratio of the the three components of measurement you know the 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 width of the the rungs on the ladder the distance between them and the the, yeah. the length of the spiral going uh, to each one being the golden mean golden mean squared and golden mean cubed respectively that to me was just like the most incredible thing I ever heard <laughs> yeah, that, that, the, all the graphics are at goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto and the film, etc. It was called Purpose of DNA. And actually, the, some of the original work on that, the X, Y, and Z uh, spin radii being golden ratio exponents, came from Ann Ting uh, from uh, Geometric Extensions of Consciousness who worked with Coxeter. So there's a long line of scientists who really are behind that discovery. But you're right. If you meditate on that, your DNA will implode. And, and, <laughs> and the thing is, actually, then when we measure the effect on recursive phase coherent braiding in DNA induced by EKG coherence, uh, you know, the EKG harmonics are doing the phonon geometry to implode that recursive braiding and the plot thickens. <laughs> <laughs> right. And right. That was the whole next layer. Yeah. And then your DNA rides a longer wave and suddenly you're steering tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, just, uh, steering tornadoes is literally the, the, you couldn't have said it more perfect because well <laughs> again a conversation for another time but um yes steering tornadoes <laughs> yeah. um so and, and so now uh it, it's it's important also not only to and 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 now you know i like keeping these two um 
these two entities together in the conversation now, DNA and water. Um, it's also, it's important for people to understand not only how the external environment affects our water and our DNA, but how we as, as you know, individual entities or in group, however, how we can impose effect on, on those, those two entities as well, our water as well as our DNA. Exactly. And, and that's why we tried to do that work on measuring the effect of coherent emotion on DNA breeding. That, you know, when you squeeze someone to say, I love you, if you did it accurately, and it's measurable, the change in pressure over time of the love hug in the Centix literature reached a pressure maximum at 0.618 into the duration of the love hug, which is actually measurably implosive. So the choice intuitively to choose coherent emotion is something we can, we can choose, actually. Even the geometry of the perfect birth canal reaches a point of maximum pressure at 0.618 in the duration of the passage, meaning that it, rebirthing is implosive, meaning you know, that's how you bring memory through birth and death, by the way. These are black hole phenomena. So yes, it is all about actually ultimately making the decision to choose emotion that actually is implosive and embedding. And I'm, I'm just noticing the numbers, 0. 0.618, the 8 and the 1 make a 9, and you have a 6, and, and these are coming back to Tesla's numbers of 3, 6, and 9, um, which is also in vortex, vortex-based mathematics as, as being probably the most important numbers, 9 being the most important of all numbers and the most powerful. Well, it, it, good, and I always like to relate the numerology to physics, but it, it's true that in plasma physics, it has been proven uh, that nine toroidal domains nested one above the other is the moment of self-organization for living plasma, and that's Los Alamos, uh, Tony Parad and John McGovern. Graphics are at goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers, and uh, so it's true. That's effectively, you have nine chakras for a reason, and all the ancient cultures talked about the nine, uh, Egyptians, the Greeks, the Anunnaki, they were all called the nine for the, and the physics is plasma actually and self organization. So yes. Interesting. Even, even going into uh, not quite as ancient, but even into, into Buddhism with the 108 beads on the, on the prayer, the prayer necklace yes, well, and things like that. Well, that the 108 degree angle of the pentodeca actually, but yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, let me think now. Um, what else? What else can we cover while we're here? Um, well, I just maybe I could yeah. mention. So, you know, in terms of our biofeedback, we froze. Uh, Dan froze. Not sure what we'll do here. Maybe we may have to reconnect. Uh, let me try chatting. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. You are frozen in time okay we lost Dan maybe he'll he'll chime back in so we'll wait a minute but really what what an incredible conversation um what uh, and what a guy you know Dan is really you know he's working on some extremely high level projects um so I really do appreciate him taking the time today and, and again, you know, a lot of what he's saying, you know, a lot of the, um, the science that he may be speaking that sounds, may sound Greek to some of you listening, um, it's really just a matter of taking some time to sit with it and understand it. And, you know, once you do, uh, it, it, really, it really changes your perspective profoundly uh, on a lot of things. When, once you really understand the, the science of nature um, and of our nature and of our, the, the science of our interconnectedness with nature. Ding dong, he's back. Sorry, hey, Dan. Okay. All right, not a problem. Um, so just, shall I finish the thought that I was- Yes, please, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So then maybe you can splice this together. So yeah. just, uh, you know, we make options available in biofeedback 
which are, is very evolved now. We have about six apps on the App Store. They're iOS apps. Um, we had um, iThrive.com for HRV breath coherence, I-T-H-R-V-E.com, iThrive.com. And uh, then our brainwave technology, which also measures life force, flameinmind.com, um, which can measure life force in buildings as well as brainwave uh, meditation bliss. Uh, and Flame and Sound, which is the most powerful binaural beat for audio bliss. And now, just this week, we're releasing the newest, which is realheartcoherence.com, which is a new two-channel EKG preamplifier that will measure two hearts, full EKG, at once. And you can dramatically when, measure when two hearts link up and when they're coherent together. And you can measure and teach en empathy and tantra. It's gorgeous. Are you and, serious? That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, it... it, it it's the ultimate uh, Tantra empathy. Uh, we actually sold that system to the largest bank in Australia to teach bank managers to get on the same wavelength as their clients. And uh, it's now realheartcoherence.com and there's a new pre app. Wow. And it's, a, you know, originally that system cost, you know, a couple thousand dollars and now it's about 290. It's, it's wonderful. Amazing. That's amazing. I'm, I'm going to get with that and, uh, and do a video on that as soon as, uh, as soon as I have that. And to speak, with, to, uh, to speak to what you were saying earlier, which is all interrelated and in what we're talking about right now um, regarding a love hug, I mean, that's, um, that's something that I think people can, can relate to on the sense that, you know, there are some people that you know just give really good hugs. You know, there's this idea, you know, because you hear it. You see people and you see people gathering and you see hugs and you... You hear someone say, wow, you know, you, or I love your hugs, or you always give the best hugs. And there's a reason for that. And it's, and, and it's all, you know, rooted in, in a lot of what, uh, in exactly what we've been talking about today uh, over some of these topics, um, which has to do a lot with empathy and, um, and just, uh, you know, being, uh, putting oneself in, in the space of those, of those frequencies to, to, to just, you know, give of oneself and receive of another in totality. Yes, and and when we realize that the geometry of love actually is that 0.618 golden ratio of embeddability, it, it teaches us about what it is to prepare for death or lucid dreaming or bliss, which is to not need secrets anymore, actually, which, where you're in that situation where charge distribution is perfect and therefore secrets are not required, which is sort of the opposite of modern culture. <laughs> but yet, really, the only way to successfully enter the black hole of, of successful death, which is compression, actually. so Is to just let go, essentially. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we know now that, it, that the reason the visions seen at death are electrically contagious, and the reason that you see those Heinrich Cluve form kinds of lattice cobweb tunnel spiral at the death, which are the visions that are documented you see at the death if it's successful, is because death is, a, is a, a small little implosive, we call it a black hole, but it's simply charge implosion. And that uh, obviously the electrosmog in a hospital is not helpful for that actually. Uh, so that, that's an example of entering an electrical environment where distribution is enabled by successful compression to that Planck threshold. So uh, clearly the, the process of falling in love or the swoon of love is, is similar to that still point of death, which is a point where all waves can converge and be distributed. So, so it, it should in fact not be feared. <laughs> well, actually um, it, it can be used. Uh, successful death is electrically measurable and uh, it is, Basically, the the aura's mechanism for achieving charge distribution, which you know Aboriginals would call ancestral memory, but you know, our friend Danny Schreiber, who died recently, came back and even said that there was a series of audio tones, a, a low frequency audio subsonic cascade, which went with the Clouvé form constant visions, and we also know why, because that is you, your DNA preparing your plasma for implosion, which the Egyptians called the Ba from the Ka which is when the longitudinal wave emerges from implosive compression. So, you no, know, death is a mechanism to translate the aura from transverse to longitudinal and become distributable. That's why 
being able to lucid dream predicts if you can take memory through death because your aura becomes longitudinally coherent. And, and which is why certain, certain frequencies um, that people can use binaural um, to, to help achieve uh, lucid dreaming. Yes, and, and the bliss. And, you know, um, the Monroe Institute got close there. We think our binaural beat audio frequencies are the most powerful in the world. And the flame and sound component there for those, based on the equation in my book, is very inexpensive part of flameinmind.com so you can use those binaural and that is the exact audio implosive subsonic they call it uh, infrasound cascade which drives therify.net plasma okay great yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna put links to all these things especially the apps um as uh, i'm sure many 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 listeners have iphones um uh okay let's see well, there was something else I was just about to bring up based on what you, what you said. Oh, yes. Now, speaking about that, that the, the point of death and, and where the plasma is going to go, um, I understand that uh, the, the Buddhists, in terms of um, guiding the plasma of, of whoever the... the, the the, the Buddha is at the time, or any any person, any entity. Um, that's why certain sounds are, are, you know, bells are used at the at the death and at the 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 the, cer- the, the after ceremony after when a person's departing. Certain sounds are used, um, bells and these things are these tones are supposed to be doing something to to the to the plasma or to the the, the spirit to guide it whether to a, a next body, if it's to keep it here, to come back because, you know, they, they, there's still work for, for the, that soul wants to do here, or if it's to make sure that it gets where it's supposed to go properly on the other side and things like that. So if you could speak to that. In some well, sense. yes, I mean, as we've said many times, uh, it was uh, my partner's uh, Tibetan teacher uh, was one of the first places where it was documented on video that the d- death of the high Tibetan Lama dramatically correlates to the onset of rainbows. And we've taught many times the physics of the reason that rainbows are more likely at the death of a high saint is uh, I- implosive charge compression has been added to the local atmosphere. Uh, which is the cause of rainbow. Actually, phase conjugation is the reason rainbows exist. So, you know, by adding a centripetal force electrically to the environment, it enables the creation of rainbows. And we know that Tibetans used a a particular cascade of drumming, and we now know that you can actually do a Fibonacci cascade leading to golden ratio for for bliss drumming, actually. The the whole, um, the the drummer from... uh, Paul Winter Consort used to teach that the uh, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen harmonic cascade of drumming rhythm sequences you lead to implosion. And that's the same frequency series we use for infrasound, for binaural beats, for bliss induction. So it is all about creating the implosive still point for sure. And uh, to maintain your attention during the death process, uh, which is critical. Uh, the Tibetans use that that low frequency drumming and that long wave attention span, and that makes a lot of sense, uh, actually. So obviously, they they would choose the place to die as intelligently as they would choose the rhythm of death. Mm. And um, you know, we, remember when Karatkov went to where the Kogi make phone calls to ancestors and measured the fractality of the air. Uh, which we now call sacred space. It's harmonic, inclusive, charge distribution efficiency, measurable in the air with the GDV. What we call sacred space is it enables druid phone calls. And so, you know, access to the place for successful death, the altar at Machu Picchu being an example, is the electrical opposite of a modern hospital. So until biology knows what death is for, uh, you know, hospitals are actually poisonous to successful death, largely, unfortunately. So that, that actually, that creates an opportunity, um, you know, because so as, you know, my, my circles and the, the people that I, that I, that I run with, um, you know, really what it's all about right now is finding a way to, to do something that one is passionate about that helps other people and that generates income. 
Um, and so, so going off of what you just said, it seems that there'd be a whole new world of, of, of industry in, in, in the sector of building, um, you know, positive, positive death environments, essentially, you know, I, I guess that's how yes. I w- would put yeah. it. And, and, you know, the rebirthing community started on that work. The last series of videos we did here was about placenta magic and, uh, and the physics of birthing and rebirthing have all the same electrical requirements for successful death, actually. And uh, when Akhenaten failed at his job to build a Menti Amarna, which was a plasma accelerator solar temple in which a soul group could achieve bliss together and plasma project through the heart of the sun, <laughs> that was an example of, you know, you know what needs to be built here. Right. <laughs> Which, which is the physics of Stargate, and, uh, and people need to know that the wars over Jerusalem should be canceled because that Stargate's broken, and actually learn the science of what the ancients were up to, which was building charge implosive geobiologic structures. Are you, are, you, are you talking about the one that was in Iraq? Well, you know, the, the joke is Uru Asa L M. We talked about this Jerusalem. Uru is ancient dragon blood. Asa is the royal queen of and l is the place of phase shift translation of vorticity embed in longitudinal and so obviously the physics of stargate jerusalem actually is access where a soul group could have their plasma projected into the heart of their star and if you can't get your plasma into the heart of your star you ain't graduated from kindergarten and you're stuck and so then you have a war over who gets to the get of the stargate <laughs> right right so it, and every ancient religion was about sun god. Well, what did they mean? They meant someone's plasma is coherent enough. You know, we this we know the solar flares changed dramatically the eleven different times when more than a million children sang the same song. We know the sun is making something with our DNA and it's plasma compression. Yeah, I, I understand that um our second go round in uh, in Iraq, um the the one of the first location or the first location that we went to was their the museum yeah um and and that had to do with the the stargate being buried somewhere under you know in the in the underbelly of the museum well the the remaining uh geobiological structures to create implosive compression remember the actual movie stargate when my boss at gaia.com rick hassan was one of the co-producers actually but they actually used Mm -hmm the Ophain and Minokian letters to make the movie Stargate. And if you study the plasma physics of the Ophain and Minokian, which John Dee discovers the origin of angel magic. Remember all the plasma universe physicists today believe in angels, every one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the, the, the Ophain and Minokian angel alphabet was actually used to make the movie Stargate because that's hypercube implosive plasma physics. So, you know, it, let's assemble our, resources here and get the stargate ready because the kids are stuck in a kindergarten a long way from downtown <laughs> <laughs> and we want to get where we're supposed to be i tell That's you right. <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> well you know they say that it, all the the ancient religions including christianity were actually about a solar being a sun god they called it anu and the, the saying is among advanced shaman that if you're extraterrestrial arrives in a plasma cloud that came through the heart of the sun, then you should say hello and initiate a conversation. Whereas if your ET arrived in heavy metal, then you know they're from the wrong side of the track. Ah. <laughs> that makes sense, actually. That does make sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought about that. Um, you know, oh, what I was going to say was that, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali had that, uh, process at his funeral. He actually had um, the the Buddhist drumming and bell tolling. Oh uh, yes, he had that. Uh, you know, he had that already predetermined. He he had everything set up to be done at at his time of death. So he knew he was on some some next level stuff. If he was, you know, if he had that incorporated into his his uh, his his transitional ceremony. Yeah, and and. When Joseph Smith was first interpreting Urim and Thummim, the Mormon was genetic records in plasma donuts. 
he was learning the fire letters of sun gods, you know, <laughs> that's how the ancient Draco ancestors re preserved more uh, genetic records. And, and so these were all alphabets of plasma designed to achieve uh, basically ability to inhabit a star. It sounds like a lot, but my Kundalini teacher, Bentoff, uh, uh, goldenmean.info slash Kundalini, he felt his aura get big enough he could, he could wiggle the earth, and eventually the whole lineage of shaman could see through the heart of the sun like it was an eyeball, actually. And that is, that is what it means to grow up. And you know, if your local physicist wants to grow up, ask mm. him how tornadoes get eyeballs. <laughs> 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 they, they're navigable you know any shaman knows how to steer one well how did the tornado which is the same as saying how does plasma become self-aware physics physicists are very clear 99.99 percent .99 of the universe is plasma and any physicist who studied plasma clouds knows they can become self-aware so how they become self-aware a good way to start the lesson is to have telepathy with ball lightning. You know, Suddenly the physicist is beginning to think about awareness in plasma, and then they can think about taking memory through death. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that a good step, a good first step for, for most people to, to even begin to, to, to physically touch upon these, these ideas and, and, um, and work with these energies, a good starting point is is meditation because what i found is that the most important probably just about the most i mean oh, your your awareness has to be there number one of course you've got to be aware on certain levels but then it really comes down to the ability to focus that awareness and to and to essentially round up every single aspect of your being all uh, every point of energy w within grasp and focus that into into the task at hand or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish or focus on and no secrets as you said earlier so a few years back um uh, a friend of mine well she's uh you know had a we had, we had a relationship and uh she she lives in texas and she called me she was she was at work and there was a tornado um headed directly for her area directly at towards the building that she was working in and you know this was a person i cared for tremendously and i would do anything you know i would do anything to to make sure that she's okay so when I, as soon as i heard that I said, okay, let me call you back. Give me, you know, give me a half an hour. To let me do something. She said, what are you going to do? She, and she said, they were all standing in the stairwells of the building because it was the structurally, structurally it was the strongest point in the building were the stairwells. So I hung up the phone and I immediately went into, you know, into my process and my zone, you know, and I think each person has to figure out how to do it for themselves. But I went in and I, I harnessed and I pulled from anywhere and everywhere. I called upon, you know, my spirit guides. I, I, I reached to as far, the farthest reaches of the universe, and I pulled as much power as I could. I focused myself on the, the location of, of, of the tornado. I focused on her. I focused all of my love energy on protecting her and that area where she was. And I just gave it everything I possibly could. And I called back and... The first thing she said to me when she picked up the phone was, what did you do? <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean? And I knew what I did, but I didn't know. I didn't know yet. You know, I, I have to get confirmation that it, it did anything. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, the news is talking about how this tornado had a, a very, it was, it was going in a very particular direction and all of a sudden changed course. <laughs> Well, out of nowhere, it changed direction. And that's when I realized, holy shit, I did it. <laughs> and there are many stories like that. It's beautiful that it's personal for you. It's beautiful. And to recognize that the tornado follows the center of lowest pressure, and the lowest pressure is the implosion point, and that's the conjugate point. And that's where you reach into when you find which wave is shareable, sometimes called pure attention, which means what's good for both the tornado and the people. Mm. <laughs> you know, and and right. the, 
the shaman would call it feeling the pain of the tornado, which is the same thing as to say the tornado feels pain the same way people do, does when charge bleeds due to fractality broken. So, you know, when, when, you, when you, the tornado feels that you feel its pain better than it feels its own pain, it's happy to follow you, actually. <laughs> but, you know, and the physics of meditation there is, is very specific, that you describe the psychology of compression when you describe meditation just now. And perfect compression is obviously golden ratio, and that's teachable as golden ratio in brain waves. And that's what flameandmind.com is. And that is the phase conjugate implosion called bliss, actually. And that's the intro to the physics of Kundalini, which is the metabolic acceleration, like lightening up the tailbone that results from that compression. And, you know, for the first six months after Kundalini, I was crying, actually, pretty much, which is to say every memory that ever wasn't shareable. <laughs> right, surfaced. Needed sorting. You know? Right. <laughs> and, 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 but that's an in introduction to how the aura then gets big. It's very simple, actually. Yeah, it was it, it was a tremendous experience, and I you know, and I've had a few over the years that left me as well so so moved that you, you, these tears, you know, you just you can't help it. That's a um, and the, the the feelings that that come and, and that you know that happens at moments of uh, supreme realization of certain things. Um, you know, where I guess we'll say you you, you plug deeper into. Uh, all that is, um, as well as in in having communications with ancestors and and, um, yes. and those, they, you know, when 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 the uh, when the environment is such that it's 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 love on both sides and and it's um, you know uh, there was uh, <clears throat> essentially a spiritual contract was made where you know, one side requests permission to engage and the other side has to give the permission. All this happens on a spiritual level, but the okays are given. Well, when that, when that communication has complete, I mean, what you're left with is this incredible, profound, you can't even, you really can't even put it into words. Uh, uh, it's beautiful. It's so well said, exactly. And so you, you reach that stage of communion, and we think we understand the physics that longitudinal waves are embedded at both ends of that wormhole. For example, why Therify.net plasma, so successful for action at a distance, works better at sunrise or sunset, or you know, at solstice or all these things, because that's where longitudinal waves embed. And the same thing for these communion experiences. And and one other thing uh, I would like to say. It, we, we actually add to their beauty by understanding the physics that we, I'm admiring your, your appreciation of the beauty. Oh, one of the I just like mm -hmm. to say about sending love. I think I did this little exercise with Bob Dratch. You know, we, it's been measured many times that when children send love, this effect on seed germination we mentioned is fabulous. Uh, Larry Dossie's work, but <laughs> Bob did this study where if you send love to someone who's not ready to receive it, <laughs> <laughs> right? There, there's a bit of a lesson here. And actually, it's not unlike, again, Therify.net or Implosive Plasma in general. It will drive the reaction to completion for better or for worse. <laughs> right, right. It'll, it'll, you'll get there, but, but, but how they're going to ultimately respond to it. Well, actually, what it means is, is, you know, we say Therify or Implosive Plasma or Bliss is a metabolic accelerator. Well, that's true. And that will drive all reactions to completion. That's true. It'll increase metabolism and heart rate, and that's plasma fire, and that is awareness. But if it's not ready for perfected collapse, then, then, then there will be some heat generated along the way. Right. Okay, right. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like falling in love with somebody who doesn't love themselves. It can be very messy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, which is why um, what, you know, a, a friend of mine, I, I, I'm not sure if, if, if you've uh, had interaction with him or not. I, I think you have. Um, he goes by Aeon. Do you know Brother Aeon? Oh, I've heard of. I've heard of Aeon. Okay, yeah. So, so Brother Aeon, um, you know, one of the projects that they're working on is focused around um, emotional intelligence and teaching that to children. And that is so important. Like, I mean, I don't, I can't begin to express how, how, what a change, what a drastic change we would see in, 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 in human culture 
which of course would spill into the, the overall biodome, but what drastic, beautiful change we would see um, if emotional intelligence was, was taught uh, to, to children as a, as a requirement. I mean, it's got to be there. Absolutely. Well said. Yes. And I've devoted a big part of my life to the teaching of coherent emotion and providing biofeedback tools for that. But that's exactly what that is. And ultimately, that's what's going to differentiate us from an artificial intelligence Borg culture. Those who can choose emotional intelligence are the ones who emerge and the rest become. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You're right, absolutely. And teaching the young people about emotional intelligence, and that's why the physics of emotion is so critical. And you know, we did document the musical wave shapes of emotion beautifully at goldenmean.info/touch, and the scentic literature and the musical wave shapes of specific emotions: anger is destructive, and love is constructive interference. And why? And the shape that the way you hug someone. So emotional intelligence is so critical. So I appreciate your understanding of that. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. And and um and that also uh you know we can also bring up um uh dr emoto masuro emoto's work uh with water you know again and and the power of intention on the the geometric shapes of the the the, the molecules in in water which we could do to yes, anything we- we knew dr emoto very well and lectured with him quite a few times our friend georg sponsored his center in Europe in Luxembourg. And um, he did a wonderful service in uh, interesting so many people in the physics of water and love and water. Uh, And he really wasn't quite ready for the science, but uh, Karatkov, Professor Karatkov, traveled with him a lot, even including Lake Baikal, and measured uh, the effect on the water of their love ceremonies, et cetera. So in, in effect, that, that did launch the world on a beautiful understand, study of water. Actually. Yeah, that was really big. That, and that came out of, uh, well, I, I will say that it was presented on a, uh, on a larger scale through that documentary, What the Bleep Do We Know?, which was the, the quantum physics documentary years ago. I think that came out in 04. And, uh, yeah. Of, of course, we, we were all, you know, a little bit... Uh, disappointed that they didn't do real physics in that video. But Bruce Lipton is a very sweet guy, and he's right about the fractality of uh, cell membrane being the brain of the cell. But, you know, we can do so much more than that now in terms of fractal field physics. So we're really looking for making real uh, physics demo. And actually, you know, I will say that our new published paper, which is coming out now on the physics of gravity, we're hoping that when we prove how fractality causes gravity, we will actually, in the process, prove how consciousness makes centripetal force. And so we, we want a whole new level of physics in these new, in these new movies. So that's our intention from this end. So the idea is to, is to get back to um, the, the, the levels of understanding and, and consciousness and, and energy um, output and energy environment uh, that was that was present, say, during uh, the times of Lemuria and, and, and civilizations like that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, clearly Atlantis, uh, Thule, was and named outline, yeah. was, was named after Thoth for a reason. The concentric rings were implosive capacitance of land water. But the, the real physics, the problem is, and this is, this is the hermetic problem, the uh, caduceus in modern physics is called phase conjugation. And phase conjugation or charge implosion is what happens when you have bliss and peak consciousness and you make a centripetal force, which is negentropic. So mind, the the role of mind among waves is to implode them, obviously. But the thing, the thing about all that is as a physicist, you could not possibly understand the role of mind among waves until you know why an object falls to the ground. You can't, there's no way. (laughs) <laughs> and so that's the question we're answering in this new paper, actually, which is, you know, the, any physicist who's actually thought about it, they all agree that fractality obviously is the cause of gravity because implosive compression, non-destructive compression was Einstein's name for gravity. But not one of them actually thought about what a fractal electric field is, fractalfield.com, obviously, which is called phase conjugation, golden ratio to Planck. So we, you know, now we actually have propulsion technologies that result from this. So now that we can teach physicists why an object falls to the ground, and Einstein did not have the first clue, it doesn't appear, uh, then we can actually teach them the role of mind among waves. So that's my little two cents. Which is, which is pretty awesome, because that's really going to open the doors to uh, tremendous 
uh, new worlds uh, yes. of, of yes. technology and of, of healing, you know, in, in the health sector, um, being able to yes. heal the earth and, and, and bringing back a lot of ancient technology, um, which, which really is where the only place we need, there's only two places that we need to look to find the answers to everything that we've ever wanted to know. And that's in the, in the deep past or in the deep self. <laughs> well, yes, and, and, and in both places lies the longitudinal wave, and that's the answer both to what is a gravity wave and also the answer to what is action at a distance and the answer to going through the speed of light, all of which was Einstein's mistake. You know, he thought action at a distance was spooky, <laughs> he, and he thought going through the speed of light was a speed limit, and that's also why he, that implosive compression, uh, which is gravity, uh, eluded him. So, you know, we need to fix a few of these Einstein mistakes in order to actually go through the, go through the last barrier, as Rashad Field would describe it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, glad you say, I'm glad you say that. And I really want these, these certain, certain words and ideas to penetrate the minds of, of those listening. Having to, to, to undo or reconstruct or reconfigure um, ideas in science that, that up till now have been, you know, uh, perceived to be solid and, you know, and, and sure people have to come to terms with the fact that there was a, there's, there was a lot missing, a lot of information missing, uh, a lot of information overlooked, a lot of information swept under the carpet intentionally. And, and due to all that, the, the models of science that we have today are, are um they're just not they're just not right and a lot of the science that people like yourself bruce um and a lot of the other the the leading um leading scientists and physicists in in these fields are putting together are really going to just have such an incredible effect but people have to be open to that idea they have to really realize that wait a minute maybe we didn't have it figured out um you know maybe we exactly. maybe you know, this, maybe there was a, a, a model that all the rest of the calculations were put in place to fit the model that they, that they thought was the model and that they were trying to push on everyone in order to, you know, make everyone seem like they knew what was going on. Put it like that. Well, and it's really true that Einstein was truly a genius and relativity was important. And when he invented the photoelectric effect, he deserved Relatively important. <laughs> he, he deserved the Nobel for that, the photoelectric. Yeah. Unfortunately, so since he got so many things right, people assumed he got everything right, and he got some critical things absolutely wrong to the point of destroying our possibility of evolution. And those things are thinking that speed of light is a speed limit. It is not. The most common velocities measured faster than light, Professor Raymond Chow, are between 1.5 and 1.7 times C, the speed of light. And when that is confirmed to be 1.618 times C, the speed of light, my theory of gravity will be proven. And uh, then Einstein thought that action at a distance was spooky, when in fact it's the norm, and longitudinal infer interferometry is the solution, and all of spiritual phenomena is understood well, including lucid dreaming and action at a depth at a distance and life after death, collective unconscious, all is completely revealed by studying the physics of longitudinal interferometry. So these blindnesses, and then when you realize that the longitudinal wave is the gravity wave, <laughs> longi it's Gravitobiology, the new book by Tom Bearden, suddenly, the, the, literally mankind is released from a cage of what I call Einstein-induced insanity. <laughs> this is all at fractalfield.com slash conjugate gravity. So that would be an, an energetic um, frequency uh, cage. Uh, that it is. It, it, yeah. It's a cage. But not knowing how longitudinal waves act at a distance means we cannot understand death we cannot understand spiritual healing. We cannot understand remote healing. We cannot understand ancestral memory. We cannot understand DNA radio. And actually, it is the holy grail of plasma containment at a distance that solves all fusion energy research. It's longitudinal interferometry. And by the way, it is the difference between the U.S. military and the Russian military. Sorry, U.S. military. You are a joke. 
until you know that. Agreed. <laughs> and so, so now I'd like to, to, to ask what you, so what you were saying about 1.618. Um, so almost 1.7 in terms of, uh, uh su super luminal speeds that, um, you're saying what, what kinds of, of objects or what kind of particles or what, uh, can be measured traveling those speeds? Well, uh, the way those measurements are made, Professor Raymond Chow, C-H-I-A-O, showed that the dominant speeds faster than light in all of his measures are, are between 1.5 and 1.7 times C, the speed of light. Those measures are typically made by uh, optical fiber measurements in super luminal uh, signal propagation optical fiber arrays in high uh, fast sampling rate oscilloscopes, digital scopes, actually. So there's lots of ways to measure fast and light velocities. But of what? Like what, what is moving at those speeds? Well, in this case, uh, conventional physics would call it the tunneling of the, uh, the phase propagation velocity, which uh, let me uh, say that another way. It's almost like the, an opening of a black hole, kind of? Like, <laughs> well, it, in a it, sense, it, it, like the opening happening that... What we're saying here is it's the only possible definition of what a black hole is because it's the only definition of what gravity is. But look at, look at the top-down view of hydrogen. I'm the guy that proved that three radii of hydrogen are exactly golden ratio times Planck. So if you make a drawing of that, you have you pentac golden mean spirals, a nest of five of them, and that's hydrogen radii. So look at the top-down view. The waves going towards center are adding and multiplying recursively, not just the frequency, but the wave propagation velocity called phase velocity is able to add and multiply constructively recursively. And that produces acceleration towards center from simple compression towards center. And that acceleration of charge towards center, only possible with golden ratio phase conjugation, is named the gravity. Because obviously Einstein was right, there is no experiment that can differentiate acceleration from gravity. And when you know the only way you can accelerate charge <laughs> moving towards center is golden ratio phase conjugation, because it's the only way the phase propagation velocities can recursively, constructively, heterodyne, non-destructively. We proved in the Navier-Stokes wave equations that golden ratio is the only possible solution to recurs recursive constructive wave interference in general. And if you know, the only possible solution to constructive wave interference in general is Golden Ratio by equation. Fractalfield.com slash mathematics of fusion. We published that. It's in the, it's in the mathematics literature. Suddenly, here, now you have an equation that proves the only solution to constructive wave interference. And if you know the only solution to constructive wave interference, suddenly you know exactly the only solution to Einstein's dilemma, which was infinite non-destructive compression, which he named the gravity. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's some, that's some heavy stuff. It really is. And I, <laughs> it gets a little heavy. <laughs> it's heavy, you know, and, and I, I, I do hope that, that, that people are, you know, people are, are getting some, some level of, of understanding of this and take the time um, when they have it. Uh, which is a whole nother topic on how people's time uh, has been usurped, time and energy have been usurped. But, um, so fractality, fractality causes not only gravity, but all negentropy and consciousness itself. So, so, then another, so then a question I would have is, if, so if there are processes measurable at superluminal speeds, yeah. what, what does that allude to in, in terms of, time travel or the order in which events are happening, you know, what does that say about what's going on here? Um, has it, did it already happen? Is it, is it, is it, you know, is it, is it, was it pre pre written? Does that have, does that science of, of superluminal processes happening, you know, and, and our understanding of, of, you know, where well, we say time travel. Yeah. Go ahead. So what we think is that now, so you get this pine cone kissing nose, and the pine cone is the golden ratio spiral down the cone, which is named hydrogen, and it reaches the Planck threshold, and the transverse up and down electromagnetic inertia at the Planck threshold goes from up and down to compressional longitudinal, sometimes incorrectly called scalar, which is faster than light. And 
enabling charge distribution in that array is named the gravity because that's where charge goes out through center, answering Einstein's question of what makes infinite charge compression non-destructive because the charge is a way out through the speed of light at the center into an array of golden ratio nodal grid, which enables that faster than light propagation efficiency, which is a whole series of harmonics of golden ratio times C the speed of light, which is why conventional physics just discovered that the major arrangement of masses in the universe is dodecahedral and fractal. It's proven. And now we know why, because that's the only way gravity becomes negentropic and stable. So that's a beginning of understanding what that array enables. And at the same time, your question about time, <clears throat> Einstein was actually wrong. Space-time is not bent. It's the incorrect language. What happens is we now know that charge, first of all, the, the ether is simply a compressible superfluid. And when it compresses and rarefied, that's named plus and minus charge. And when that charge rotates, it stores inertia, the only definition of mass. And when that charge rotates, it has a period, the only definition of time. So when you accelerate what's called a particle, which remember is just spinning charge, that spin rate speeds up. And so when Einstein says the time change, no, no, just the spin rate speeds up, which is the only definition of time. So now a practical example of that. In phase conjugate optics, when they measured time reversal for the first time, <laughs> uh, what they discovered is you cannot time reverse toward disorder only toward order. You can time reverse rusted steel and make it unrusted, but you cannot do the reverse, which means neg entropy is the only real meaning of time reversal. Now let's look at another practical example of that. When you have a strong emotion, you can go back to that place as an anchor in time because of the spin density. So actually the only thing that's bent when Einstein says it's bent space time, no, no, fractality and conjugation causes the waves to converge and creates that anchor point in the longitudinal array. That's which, which again are like little black hole points. And we, it, it, physicists argue about whether you should call every charge implosion a black hole. <laughs> right. But, but that's, that's splitting hairs. The fact yeah. is the charge implosion is the only point at which you create negentropic points of awareness, which is why it's so important for these magnetic line cross points. So, 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 right. So basically, so, so uh, a, a, a circumstance or a point or a moment in, in a person's life that is so, um, you know, so, so deep that you're saying this, the, the, the spin, uh, the spin density, um, that happened within the body, um, or the, the mind body at that time is so heavy that it creates a little, a little pocket of that, that you can always kind of, well, you call it, a wrinkle. Yeah, call it a wrinkle in time, but in practicality, what it means, supposing someone dies with a negative emotion, and so they're stuck, their plasma can't distribute. So they have to go back and find the intensity of that emotion. Usually they need a living person to get enough critical mass of charge implosion to get distributed again to release that ghost. Therify.net is helpful. So what's happened there is that they're frozen in quote unquote time until they can discover what part of that inertia could become shareable, literally, to release that. So that the psychology fits the physics. That's the point. But we have do, do we have any idea what exactly the the the, the plasma uh, the plasma being at that point um, how is it perceiving that scenario? Does it understand the physics of it, or is it kind of just following a and a, a more of an emotional, spiritual, emotional uh, understanding to try and be able to, to disperse? I, I think if the ghost understood the physics, it wouldn't. <laughs> but but it, but the physics is clear. You can measure the presence of a ghost by a low by a. Uh, a temperature reduction in that place, and we know why. And Karatkov measured where your ghost goes after death, which we now know is what Castaneda called place of power, which is simply the charge implosion that allows the plasma to achieve transverse to longitudinal distribution and enter ancestral memory. Uh, and why there's a hole for grandmother in the roof of a good Swiss house uh, when she dies. 
so uh, you know, the, the releasing ghosts is a, the introduction to where plasma can become immortal by achieving distribution, which is why the Hebrew name for heaven, Plains of Sharon, is like the English name for hey, ave, breath of charge, distributed, taken flight. Because literally, plasma needs to achieve charge distribution, and that's the fractality of the collective unconscious. So how would a, an ancestor uh, actively choose to, um, you know, one that's not stuck, uh, choose to manifest you know how how would that process kind of happen? How would they, if they if they, you know, if they felt okay, I need to get a message across, and this is not a plasma that's stuck, but has already distributed, but still feels like there's some job to do or a message to get across. You know how how would they go about that? Well, you know, we've told the story before, but when the Aboriginal mother first feels baby in the womb she goes to the shaman and they paint a picture on a rock of the magnetic lines of just that spot, which becomes the title deed to the land to which that child is responsible to lucid dream, which they know will literally hold that land together. And the song line dreaming track then is the array for that ancestral memory. And when the great grandmother died in Australia and the storm went across the entire continent at her death, uh, it was the magnetic line of that ancestry uh, actually imploding, actually. So th there's an intimate relationship between ancestral memories and the ge geobiology of great magnetic lines, which is why the Hopi had the major rebellion when the Americans thought they were going to put metal s steel sewage pipes on the sacred burial ground because they knew that this was ancestral memory and there's nothing more important in culture. And the metal would disrupt it completely the fractality of the dielectric of the charge distribution of ancestor memory. You know, and this is such a, it's, it, I really, I really love this, the, the science and I, and I love these discussions because they confirm a lot of things that, that, um, that I myself have, have, have kind of known that I've spoken to people about things that I've said over, you know, decades at this point. Um, and, you know, like the, the way I, the way I, I explain it, I get into conversations with people all the time and, you know, they come, they come to my home and we, we partake of the herb. We, we have session, we talk life, we, we go, you know, I like to go into deep, deep discussion. You know, that's really the, the richest communication. And, you know, we'll often talk about, um, you know, there are things that are going on in their life, relationships with other people and, and, people not understanding certain things or not being in resonance with certain things and, or not, you know, having attained certain development of self spirit and, um, and, and reach certain frequencies. And, and I explained because you also have people that you can tell from a young age, they just know things, you know, they, it's already there. So the way I've always explained it is that, you know, as the, as the soul is kind of going through its, its journey, um, and cycling, cycling through physical form. The objective, obviously, is to reach that 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 highest frequency, the the Christ consciousness, as some call it. Um, and I think so. So basically, what I have understood is that everyone has a different level of how much of their spiritual knowledge, which as they're going through lives, I, I say that we have like a backpack, a spiritual backpack, and we put that information in there as tools as we're going through, you know, through our journey. And everyone has a different level of how much of their tools that they've, that they've uh, uh, accrued over time that they've brought forward with them into this incarnation um, at their disposal. Some people retain more from their past, uh, you know, experiences, and some people are like wiped clean and are like at square one and trying to figure everything out. And then, you know, you've got that whole spectrum and someone can be anywhere on, on that line. And I've also come to, you know, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of have determined that some people, there are just certain things that they're just not going to get in this incarnation. It's going to take them more time to, to get there. Some people are open, ready and willing and able to, to advance quicker and, and, and do that. But, 
some people, I think, just aren't going to get certain things in this incarnation. So that's my, um, you know, way I've come to understand and explain certain things. Can you speak to that? <laughs> well, you know, it's true that when people do rebirthing and certain things to get through the trauma of their birth or their childhood, suddenly they get closer and closer to having access to bliss. We had this lady in Australia. She couldn't make bliss in her brainwaves. She went out with the shaman at lunch and cried about her childhood um, trauma. And after lunch, she came back and had gorgeous bliss in her brainwaves. And when you have bliss, you can reach that implosive still point, and then your whole tool toolbox is suddenly available. It's the result of compression, actually. That's what bliss is, and you feel that lightning. And then the ancestor voices in your ears start to ring and... <laughs> So, it, it, you know, access to bliss experience is what turns on that radio and getting through your trauma and going back to the place of stillness. It's, you know, finding the place where memory was interrupted during the pain and having continuity of memory enables you to come to the stillness of bliss. So rebirthing and reliving your trauma and those things ultimately coming to the point of bliss and the hygiene. And we've taught about that hygiene for years uh, live food and all those things you know about goldenmean.info slash conscious kids we have the book on uh, implosion secret science of ecstasy and immortality uh, hygiene for kids so yeah this has been great I appreciate and I really appreciate working with you and I'd be happy to do more in the future as I do with you Dan very much so and uh, yeah if, if, if we can if we could make this a a you know, I, I understand and appreciate your schedule. Um, if we could make this a somewhat uh, regular thing, would be really, really beautiful um, to me personally, and and really so much for my listeners. Um, I, you know, for me, the greatest, one of the greatest things that um, the, what gives me great joy is being able to share knowledge and share. Um, sources of knowledge so that people can access that themselves and and ha have the, those processes for themselves and have those awakenings for themselves um, so I'm so happy really really truly happy to, to have had this conversation with you today and touched upon so many um, great topics uh, for people to to really just think about and uh, and look into um, it's very special and uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. I, I can only resonate to the sincerity I feel from your eyes. So uh, it's all done with mirrors. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I, huh? no, tell people that all the index are at fractalfield.com and therify.net. But thank you. And I look forward to sharing the film and do, happy to do more in the future. Wonderful. Thanks, Dan. Um, Peace and love to you. Thank you. And I do look forward to speaking with you again soon and hopefully seeing you um, in, in your part of the world soon. I do have something I need to do over there, so hopefully I'll make it there soon. And soon. If you come to Saint South France, we'd love to see you. Blessings, of course. Sounds great. Yes. Awesome. Thank Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Peace, Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, there it is. You heard it here first. You heard the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Winter in the house today. What a great conversation. I mean, there's just there's just so much there. There's so much, you know, for you to to sit with and think about and look up and research and, and understand. I mean, there's just so much um, and to confront. And so, you know, I just wanted to once again go ahead and, and, and just thank Dan for coming on the show, taking the time and giving his energy to, to us and his knowledge. Really, the only other things that I wanted to say, you know, it's like, it's difficult when you're engaging someone like Dan and you know already going into it that it's very heady stuff. You know, I was, I was so, you know, I had to stay so attentive to everything he was saying to be able to respond intelligently while at the same time trying to make sure that I didn't 
you know, miss any, any questions and, and uh, you know, things that I had planned to say. So, you know, it's, it's tough. And, and through all that, you know, in, in listening to it myself and going over it, there were a couple of points, you know, a couple of moments in the conversation where I definitely had input or things to say. And I, I did not because I just had so much going on in my head trying to, to, to follow and, and uh, but but that's okay because we will we will definitely have Dan again as he did allude to on this on this call which was fantastic um, one of the well okay a few of the things I just will bring up now you know after the fact just to kind of so at least you can sit with these thoughts you know, little extra tidbits of information one of the things that that he said that that did ring a bell for me it was very interesting um you know he mentioned that holding you know once you hold that cell phone to your head that your aura is reduced by 50 percent now that's an extreme number if you think about it i mean many people you know still may not know exactly what an aura is you may not know that it is a very real energy field that is measurable and detectable around the human body um, and it is something that you can you know, work with and and use um, and fine-tune and, and expand so you know when he said that I mean that to me is a very very serious number one that I think we really should pay attention to and that's why I now most of the time I'm either on speaker uh, or on, a, on headphones, uh, not Bluetooth, but um, you know wired headphones. I don't really use Bluetooth. I know a lot of people are so used to just having it on your head, but again, these are signals that we're not supposed to be putting near our head. And something else that was interesting that that made me remember. A long time ago, you know, I first, second, and third grade, I went to yeshiva, and uh, which, for those who don't know, that's like uh, Hebrew school, essentially. It's like going to school, but it's, it's a strictly Jewish school. So first, second, and third grade, that's where I was. And one of the things that I I remember them doing, and it stood out to me because it it was it was real. It was a real thing, and I didn't understand how it worked, and you know, it, it made me remember this very interesting experiment that they had me do a couple of times, and I don't remember if, if it was because I had candy with me or if it was because they just wanted to show me something, but one of the, the teachers who, you know, most of the people there, especially the, uh, the hierarchy of the school, they were rabbis. And so one of the rabbis came to me one day, and I was in the office, and um, and and I was relatively, fre you know, not overly frequently, but I was in the office enough times because uh, the kids there gave me a hard time. I mean, this is unrelated to what we're talking about, but just you know, so you have a little insight into experience. I mean, I was I was the only brown guy there, um, you know, and so to them, I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm not I'm not one of them, even though I was. And, uh, anyway, what they did, he, he, he had me hold the candy and he told me, you know, he, he pushed my arm down. Okay. I, I held the candy in my hand with my arm outstretched, you know, perpendicular to my body, straight out. And he pushed with a certain force down on my arm. My arm went down, you know, pretty easily. And then he changed what was in my hand to an apple. And held the apple, and and I could tell because I was paying attention, and he repeated this a couple times. And he tried pushing my hand down with the apple now, and it held tremendously better. You know, my ability to resist the push. So in other words, my strength was was much greater than it was when I was holding the candy. And he did this again with comparing with an inanimate object. I don't know, maybe it was a, a stapler or. Um, something, but all things were relatively, you know, relatively similar in, in, in mass, but I mean, maybe the smallest thing was probably the candy, which, so you would think I'd be able to hold up even better, but no, and it's only really, it was only later in life that I, um, 
started to understand things that could explain how that worked, you know, and, and, and more so now that we're talking about these things. And, you know, with what Dan said, it brought me right back to that. It was very interesting. So I just thought I'd bring that up. That's a very real thing. And I assume that it, you know, it basically has to do with the, the frequency and the vibration of the object and, and therefore what, you know, what kind of effects it will have on, on our biomechanics, you know, and our overall, our aura, I guess, our, our energy field. And so, or the, you know, the two entities, both of them. Uh, probably being affected as this is everything does have its own frequency this is what you know tesla said if you want to understand the secrets of the universe think in terms of frequency vibration and energy and so so this is what we're dealing with so i just wanted to bring that up and you know also you know dan had mentioned at one point that they can't even be within a certain range of anyone turning on wi-fi because they can feel it and to that point, I, I wanted to bring up, and I'll, I'll bring it up now, that I have this with cell phones where, and I'm curious, you know, if, you know, if anyone listening has a similar experience, I'm, I'm curious uh, how many people out there do, but I, I am sensitive to it now to the point, and it's been for actually a number of years now, it's been a long time. But I'm sensitive to the cell phone where whatever part of my body that it's on, so if I'm holding it in my hand, it doesn't take more than, you know, a minute uh, or two to start feeling pain in my hand. And it, it starts light and then it'll it'll get a little more intense and more intense until I, I feel it or remember or break my concentration from the conversation enough to, to put it down. You know, or if I'm in the car and I'll, I'll sometimes rest the phone on my leg, it doesn't take long before I start getting pain in my leg right where the phone is. So I do understand that that hypersensitivity and it must have to do with, you know, a lot of things and just having your, your aura on and open and clear, um, having your pineal gland in, in good working order, having your body mostly fueled by high frequency foods you know primarily plant-based diet uh, so yeah so definitely something else that i had wanted to bring up during that conversation and one other thing that i did want to clarify during the conversation there was a point where the words i used may have sounded a little different uh, or sounded like they had a different meaning but I, which I did not intend for. So that was when I had said essentially that through the antennas being on the water towers, you know, and the, the water being served to the municipality, that it essentially is a great avenue for delivering a cancer package. And I wanted to clarify when I said that, I didn't mean per se, okay, because this is actually a very separate conversation because one we're talking about frequencies another we're talking about chemicals so in terms of the frequencies i did not mean in that instance that that was the intent that or that they are putting particular cancer packages in the form of frequency in the water no but i'm sure that they do understand that it will affect the water and that water affected by these frequencies can and will cause issues like cancer. But it seemed like it may have sounded to Dan, I meant it a little differently. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, now that I've rounded up the few points that I wanted to speak upon, I just wanted to say thank you very much for listening to another episode of the fate.org podcast. Of course, I am your host, The Wordsmith, and Fate.org, standing for the People's Honorable Alliance for Exposing the Truth, and I look forward to bringing you more great content, and I look forward to your feedback, I look forward to a lot of great things to come, I have a line of jewelry coming out very soon, uh, I'm not going to say too much about it just yet. But it's very exciting, and I think people are going to have a lot of fun with it. It's a product that fuses fun, 
facts and fashion all in one and I think that you know this is really the direction that we need to start going in as a society um, to to use these great things that we've developed like fashion and jewelry not only as merely decorative but to be able to accomplish decorative with a point with a message a positive message a positive message or information that enlightens and brings truth so that's all for now I thank you very much again for your time it is an honor and a pleasure to bring to you this great content I have much more coming peace and love to you and I will catch you on the next one